This video was brought to you by Squarespace. Okay, so there are probably some of you who have clicked on this video thinking it's some sort of parody or satirical video making fun of those overly long movie analysis videos that spend like hours tackling questions no one ever asked and I'll agree, this top is a little over the top. I'll just uh, give me one second. Uh, much better. But also you're wrong. This is a fully serious video analysis about the logistics of toy life and existence in the Toy Story series and I'm starting to think that title might be a little bit too long. So let's start at the beginning, all the way back to 1995 with Toy Story 1. And the first ever character we see come to life is Woody. Shocker, almost as if he's the main character or something. Now obviously you already know this, but this video is gonna be like 90% context, 10% content. Was that right? Did I get that right? Scott? Yeah, that was good. Yeah. So therefore, I should mention that he's a cowboy doll from the... Late 50s? And he can walk, talk, feel pain, and even fall asleep, I gather. Which is pretty much as able as any toy can be. I mention this because being alive doesn't revolve around being able to walk and talk and... I feel like there are some people who will argue that there are toys who are less alive than others because they're less able to do things, but... That's just not how it works. Being alive is a binary thing. You're either alive or you're not. And this applies in the Toy Story universe. Some things are alive and some things... Aren't. Then among those that are alive, there are toys like Woody who are just more able than others. You know, like Bullseye or RC, who are both shown to be just overpowered in how fast they are compared to the rest of Andy's toys. Like, Bullseye was able to run as fast as a plane taking off. That's 175 miles an hour. Like, but faster! But despite this, they both struggle in terms of communication, with Bullseye not being able to speak and RC having this weird revving language that only Mr. Potato Head can understand when it's most convenient to him. Hmm. Then you also have other toys such as Etch-a-Sketch or Mr. Spell who can communicate their thoughts very well, but in terms of movement, I'm not sure they should be able to. But they can, I guess. Sorry, we've been down this road before. Why are they able to come to life and wander about? And this is where definitions start to come in, like what's a toy and what's an object? Where do you draw the line between toys and objects? And don't worry, we'll get back to that later. This is a very long video, but for now, I want to talk about the anatomy of toys. Because the concept of how they are physically alive is a bit confusing. You see, they're not like humans. While we're mostly made up of oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, and phosphorus, they're made up of oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, chlorine, and sulfur. So totally different things. Meaning, unlike humans, where we have basic needs in order to survive, being oxygen, food, water, warmth, and sleep, they don't seem to have bodily fluids, so therefore don't need oxygen, because they can literally be packaged up in a box for years and not die. Nor do they need food, or at least I don't think they do, but there's this really weird scene in Toy Story 2 where Bullseye starts licking the cheesy crisp dust off Al's fingertips and I don't get it. Does he have some sort of taste? What does this feel like for Al? Like, he can definitely feel it. It's tickling him in some way, but what does it feel like? I don't know, I'm kind of just putting this scene to the side because the tongue doesn't seem to have any effect on removing the cheese dust from the fingers, and I guess it probably just felt like some sort of rubbery plastic or whatever Bullseye's tongue was made of. Unimportant. Because we also know they don't need water or warmth or... Do they need warmth? Because Woody does feel pain when Sid burns his head and I feel like they would have died if they'd gone into that fire. Oh. But I feel like that's the pain of them getting destroyed, not the heat. Like, I don't think they'd be affected by a cold. They can't get sick or anything. I don't know, toy death's confusing, okay? Like, would technically some toys die if you remove their batteries? Maybe? And there's definitely some sort of immortality aspect that if you can get played with forever or be admired through glass forever, you can live forever. And Sid shows toys can survive being absolutely Frankenstein, so... My headcanon's always been that if they are destroyed so far beyond repair that you would no longer consider them a toy and just... parts, then they're dead. But if a toy can function, it can live. And finally, I don't think they need sleep, it's more just that... They can do it. I mean, Woody does say he's tired, but then there are also multiple occasions of them just staying up all night for days on end throughout the movies, and 
Can't they don't need sleep? So since the basic rules for human survival don't apply, we've got to assume they get their life and energy from something else. And this is where we get into the theories. Yay, fun. Theory one, they get their life from children playing with them. The general idea behind this is that a child's imagination is what gives toys life. And that's why every toy just wants to be played with at all times. Because if they aren't getting played with, they can't come to life and are essentially dead. Yay, go fun theory on kids movie, woo! This can also even go one step further to suggest that toys take on the personalities their kids play with them as, and... Now, I'm not really 100% sure. Like, some toys do kind of take on the characters their kids see them as, but we also see an understanding from toys that they know they're playing a part, and some form quite significant personality traits and even relationships outside of how their kids play with them. And I think the biggest rebuttal for this is that there are examples of toys developing very intense personalities without the influence of an owner at all. So while I do like this idea and agree for the most part, it definitely isn't entirely correct. Which brings us on to theory two, that toys get their life from children writing their name on their feet. And I'm gonna be real, I'm only bringing this up because Forky having Bonnie's name on his feet was brought up twice during Toy Story 4 and... Why do I have to be a toy? Because you have Bonnie's name written on the bottom of your sticks. You have your child's name written on your feet. <laughs> sticks. That makes you a very important toy. Some people decided this was why he could come to life, but I'm telling you, it's not the smartest theory when you consider everything that happens in the other films. The rebuttal is pretty much the same. We meet toys who don't have humans' names on their feet and they're still able to come to life, so that ain't it, chief. No, I'm not saying that. Is it bad that I feel I'm not cool enough to make a, like, year-old reference to a meme I don't understand. And that leads us on to Fury Free, where toys are just alive. That's the rules of this universe, there's no rhyme or reason to it, and that is it. To which I say, BOO! That's not a very fun theory, and nor does it even work, because how can you explain why toys such as these wooden blocks can't come to life, but a spork with some wooden sticks, blue plasticine, and googly eyes can walk, talk, and see? This is more toy than this, but one of these things can come to life, and the other can't. So, where do you draw the line between object and toy? Oh, you can't? I'm feeling secondhand embarrassment for you right now because I said I would explain and draw the line between object and toy later this video, but you jumped the gun and now everyone's just sat at home thinking, wow, some people really think this? And it's awkward. For you. Which finally brings us on to theory four, being that if someone in the world has a memory of a toy, just somehow that toy can come to life. Now this is my favourite theory, because Pixar love memories. Their films almost always revolve around memories in some way or another, and while sometimes it's subtle, don't live your life reminiscing about the past, go have your own adventure. Grumpy food reviewer ends up being nostalgic for his mum's cooking. Blue fish don't remember well, ha ha. And other times it's literally, we've made an entire film in your head all about memories. And this one is all about how you survive in the afterlife based off how you're remembered by the living, and there's a song called Remember me in the soundtrack four times oh what Pixar are releasing a new film called soul I wonder what that's about what would you want to be known for on earth so I personally love this idea and just feel like it fits with their messaging that toys come to life based off human memories and the theory is basically in similar ways to Coco and Inside Out if someone alive anywhere on earth has a memory of a toy that toy can come to life. And not only do I just love the context behind it, but it's also the only theory without any holes. Because I mean, every toy we ever meet will be remembered by someone in some way. And these toys are all remembered by Andy, and those he plays with less frequently, whom you could fathom him forgetting, are all passed on before Toy Story 3. So by then, only the core group remains, and there's no argument he doesn't remember them, because he literally passes them off to Bonnie, naming them one by one. Sid would have also had memories of each of the toys he broke, and well, just did. Sid things too. I Meaning even though these aren't memories of being played with as such, the toys can still survive even if slightly disfigured. Putting it very lightly. Jessie was Emily's favourite toy, but then as Emily grew up, she ended up being neglected for years and well, yes, yeah, she claims she was forgotten. I don't believe it. Yeah, she grew up and stopped playing with you, but she didn't forget about you altogether. Like, the song literally says, smiled at me just like she used to do. That doesn't scream seeing something you'd forgotten permanently, if you ask me. With Bullseye we know, nothing about 
what his backstory was before he was in Al's possession. So I guess while he was in Al's possession, obviously he could come to life because he was part of the collection he was trying to put together. So therefore Al had memories of him and finding him and knew he was part of this collection. I, I, yeah. But what about Stinky Pete? Yeah, he could live during the events of Toy Story 2 while Al owned him, but he recalls years and years of being left on the shelf watching every other toy get bought around him. Surely there's no way anyone's remembering him during that time. But you see, this is what makes the memory theory so perfect, because it doesn't have to be a memory of being played with or owned in any way. Surely at some point there was someone who physically made and boxed Stinky Pete up, and even if they have the slightest memory of doing that, he can survive. I mean, we can only assume there was an owner of this dime store he refers to that surely knows he's on sale in this store, right? And even if you're not sold on one of these people remembering him, it just makes his backstory that much more dark because with people coming into the store every day and maybe taking a quick glance at him, creating a memory that might last an hour or so and then forgetting him, he'd be coming in and out of death every day. Well, for me personally, the short forgettable memories are just keeping him on the edge of death for a lifetime. Meaning when Al gave him this chance to live on in a museum forever, there was no way he was letting Woody stop that from happening. Which just makes Toy Story 2 way more fun, yay. And then of course the same applies to toys like Barbie and Zerg who also come to life in the store. These toys are more on display so it's safe to say the brief memories created by the people who made them and the store owners and kids who see them every day in the store are enough to keep them alive at pretty much all times. Then you have the daycare where the toys are getting played with day after day and again while most of them probably aren't creating any long-term connections or memories, all the new kids coming along every year creating new memories removes the problem of them ever being permanently forgotten and in turn dead. Okay. Um... And then finally the toys at the carnival and the antique store kind of just follow the same logic as those from Al's Toy Barn in Toy Story 2 where on the one hand I imagine the owner of the stall or shop would have some sort of awareness and memories of what prizes or items are available, but also just being seen by new faces every day, kids who are potentially interested in winning or buying them and that's enough to keep them alive for, as shown by Stinky Pete, potentially decades. You get the point, the memory theory just works. I'll do you one better, it's perfect. There is a single human with even the most faded memory orb of any toy in existence, that toy can be alive. Which brings us to the big question, what's the deciding factor? Where do you draw the line between object and toy? And to that I say, about here. Yeah. So Forky is definitely an interesting case because he's fully aware he's a spork and therefore shouldn't be able to come to life because sporks aren't toys. But then he is alive. What? Okay, let's just pause and quickly rewind this video to remind ourselves what gives toys life. If someone in the world has a memory of a toy, just somehow that toy can come to life. Meaning essentially their existence and life all comes down to what that memory is. So since Bonnie's memories of Forky are of him being a toy because, well, that's how she sees him, he is able to come to life, just like any other toy. Whereas the wooden blocks from Andy's room aren't so much as seen as toys, but more props. So despite the fact from the outside looking in, this wooden block is more of a toy than a spork, the way they're played with and how they're remembered by their owners kind of flips things around. And this applies to more than just Forky in the wooden blocks. You've got Bonnie's chair who's able to come to life, presumably because Bonnie also sees it as a toy. You've got the hockey puck with arms and legs, like, did you guys really think I was gonna go this entire video without mentioning him? Who Andy obviously sees as a toy. Basically any of these weird toys that aren't really toys that are able to come to life in Sunnyside Daycare are able to come to life for the same reason as Forky, because the memories of them are as toys. But wait, Seamus, even Forky understands he isn't a toy. The fact he can come to life and understand that he's a spork literally proves that sporks must have some sort of sentient- uh, Okay, I was literally just about to explain this, but if you wanted to embarrass yourself and make this video even more awkward by embarrassing yourself, you've succeeded because this is awkward and you've embarrassed yourself. You see, this is what brings us on to a little something come up by Ben Carlin in 2016 that I'm calling the branding theory. And you know what? Let's go hear from Ben himself. One sec. Ben, 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 Ben. Hey! Can you tell me about your video about why does Buzz freeze from 2016 and ex use that to explain why Forky can come to life in Toy Story 4? Off the top of my head? 
Obviously. Oh, obviously, yeah. <laughs> okay, but here's the thing. Just the title of Ben's video tells us all we need to know. Forky isn't the first ever toy to not believe he's a toy. Matter of fact, the whole of Toy Story 1 revolves around a toy not thinking he's a toy. You actually think you're the Buzz Lightyear? You see, Buzz and Forky actually have the same problem. They both think they're one thing when they're actually a toy. Kind of. Which brings us on to the branding theory. You see, since Buzz Lightyear is a Space Ranger action figure based off an actual character and not just a toy who's designed to be played with, he believes he is the real Buzz Lightyear. This is in comparison to toys like Rex or Mr. Potato Head, or actually Mrs. Potato Head's a great example because we see her get bought or at least given as a gift and it doesn't seem like she needs any time adjusting to life as a toy. And this is because they were made to be toys with only one purpose, to be played with. And this branding theory also applies to Forky, who believes, or maybe in his case, knows he is a sport. I am not a toy, I'm a spark. And similarly to other branded toys, needs to learn that he is, in fact, a toy. And pretty much every single new toy we meet follows this basic principle. The aliens who aren't branded and are just cheap claw machine toys know they're toys, because despite the obsession with the claw, do seem to understand that they have to go with the owner that like wins them. Meanwhile, toys such as the Barbie dolls in the store believe their purpose is to do whatever the type of Barbie doll they are does. For example, Tour Guide Barbie literally gives a tour of the store. Tour and store rhyme, nice. Ducky and Bunny, who are just cheap carnival toys, want nothing more than to be one so they can go home with a kid. The Buzz Lightyear in the store also believes he is the real Buzz Lightyear, which is kind of confusing when he actually meets and knows there are multiple other Buzz Lightyears, like, how can you be the real one when there are all these other Buzz Lightyears? And then Zerg, as well, also believes he's the real evil Emperor Zerg. Because they're based off real, fictional characters. And this is why, despite the fact Buzz and Forky don't believe their toys, do end up freezing in front of their owners, because they are toys, and toys have to freeze in front of their owners. Except, Woody. Woody, as he basically confirms himself, breaks the rules of the universe. Why? And this kind of just doesn't make sense. Until you realize Woody is more than just a toy. Somehow, even in this Toy Story universe where toys can come to life, there's something that just sets Woody aside from the other toys. Like, I started this video talking about things toys are able to do and how limited they are, at least in comparison to humans, and I'm almost picturing this spectrum. On one end, the limited things toys are able to do, and then on the other, the things humans are able to do. And Woody is so much further along than any other toy, which you've got to assume is because of his unbelievably strong connection with Andy that almost makes him ascend beyond being just a toy. He's able to speak, move, and basically isn't afraid to be reckless in front of humans. Humans. And while yes, technically speaking, we do see other toys talk and move in front of humans, no one does it quite to the same extent Woody does. We see he's not only able to communicate with, but also actually train animals, which is not something a toy should really be able to do. He manipulates people in a way no other toy dares try. Like, we see other toys fantasize about interacting with humans, but they're all talk. Woody actually does these things. And in the end, he quite literally just moves on from life being a toy and having an owner to just go out and see the world. Something that I'm pretty sure no other toy does that. I'm, I'm pretty sure exploring the world is a human only thing. I guess at the end of the day, Andy himself said it best. Woody, he's special. And for anyone really paying attention to the whole spectrum, he can talk to humans, train animals, wants to go see the world, and I mean, if he wanted to, I imagine he'd have no trouble creating a website. Oh, they wanna give me an award for the worst segue into an ad of all time. You guys, but seriously, let's talk about Squarespace. Because if you're an artist, content creator, entrepreneur, or maybe all three, just like me, <laughs> Not only is Squarespace a powerful and beautiful online platform for which to create a website to showcase your work, but you can also purchase a domain for your brand directly from them. Uh, okay, but why Squarespace specifically? Well, let me tell you about their features. Like being able to look at your analytics, see who's visiting your site and what's creating the most traffic to help you learn for the future. You can create your own community with a full-on comment section with likes and replies and basically like any other comment section. And when you purchase a domain, it comes with free Whois privacy, which is basically an internet record about domains, which 
is really important if you want to make a website. So if you're interested and want to support the channel, make sure to go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And once you're ready to launch, you can use squarespace.com slash Seamus Gorman for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And that's all I've got for you guys today. Thank you so much for watching this video all the way at the end. I know this was really long, but if you enjoyed it, please make sure to leave a like. You can subscribe to my channel by clicking here. You can watch another video by clicking here. You can check out my Patreon here and in the description down below. I've already said thanks for watching, but I guess thanks for watching again, and I'll see you guys next time.